everyone, my name is Aaron Wong. Welcome to the final uh, Road to the Lighthouse for Spring Smith 2012. As you guys have known, um, if you guys have come to our previous programming, we have discussed the myriad of issues concerning 2012 elections, from the economy, from the public, uh, from the populist movements to the role of the media, and we thought that we'd bring in our three directors of our three very prestigious institutes to give an overview of how far we've traveled and maybe give a projection for the future. Um, let me just introduce to you um, our panelists. Actually, first my co-moderator. This is Kiki Halibu, and she will introduce our um, panelists today. Also, we have results for the USC LA Times poll that Dan will be giving, so just stay tuned for that. Kiki. Hi everyone, I have the privilege of introducing you all to our lovely panelists today. All the way down, <laughs> our lovely panelists, all the way down to my first right, we have Jeffrey Callen, who is the director of USC Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy. He served as the dean of USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism from 1996 <coughs> to 2007. And prior to becoming dean, President Clinton appointed Jeff Callen to serve as the director of Voice of America. And he served on the White House Fellows Regional Selection Committee and chaired the California Bipartisan Commission on Internet Political Practices during the Clinton and Bush administrations. Um, to his left, we have Dan Masmanian, who's the director of the USC Judith and John Bedrosian Center on Government and Public Enterprise. He served as a dean and professor for the USC Sol Price School of Public Policy from 2000 until 2005. And he served as a member of the Task Force on Environmental Governance of the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development. And he's also served as the executive director of the report of the California Adaptation Advisory Panel to the State of California. And finally, we have Mr. Dan Schnur, who's the director of the USC Jesse M. Unruh Institute of Politics. He's a poll director for the USC Dornsife LA Times poll, as well as being the former chairman of the California Fair Political Practices Commission. He's also the former national director of communications for the 2000 presidential campaign of US Senator John McCain. And he spent five years as chief media spokesman for California Governor Pete Wilson. Please give them a round of applause for being here today. So I guess we'll just jump right into it. Um, my first question is for Dan, uh, Dan Schnur. I guess this is going to be complicated. <laughs> Dan Schnur. Skippy. We'll call him Skippy. <laughs> we'll say Dan S and Dan M. Um, so uh, McConnell and Boehner have officially endorsed Romney, though Santorum still hasn't. I just wanted to get your opinion on whether this is a sign that the Republican Party won't be able to rally behind Romney and whether the long and arduous primary has had an effect of whether it will be good for in general or not. Um, well, I will answer your question, Kiki, but before I do, um, I just want to uh, take a moment uh, to thank Jeff and Dan, because I think as many of you know, who've attended our events in past years, uh, for the last several years, the Unruh Institute has sponsored a, a series of weekly lunches, and this year we decided to take on an experiment in which we uh, joined forces with Jeff and Dan's respective organizations to examine the campaign, not just from a strict political vantage point, but through the prisms of public policy and communications and media as well. And one of the things we hope to do at the end of today's conversation is hear from you guys a little bit and get some feedback from you about what you think has worked and may not have was worked as well as it could have over the course of the year. Uh, but from my very, very selfish perspective, I think the fact that we've been able to broaden the base of participants and the base of attendance and uh, uh, base uh, and broaden the base of conversation and has funding been a, base and funding base <laughs> <laughs> has been a has been a has been a tremendous success. So uh, so Dan and Jeff, thank you both very much. Um, and then second, for those of you who attend these functions regularly, you might see a slightly different format today. Um, and as you know, every week. In addition to our visiting experts, we put students on the spot as panelists. And so uh, when the Unruh Institute sponsors these lunches, we refer to them as students talk back. Think of today's as students revolt. <laughs> and Kiki and Aaron have, have taken over. And I, I know we're looking forward to having them lead the conversation. All that aside, Kiki asks a, a very good question about where Mitt Romney is right now at, for what for all practical purposes, is the tail end of his primary campaign. There's no question that the primary campaign damaged Romney. Um, it forced him to fight a series of rearguard actions against a series of more conservative candidates 
but screw him for the right over the primary. And Rick Santorum, as I think most of you know, is only the latest in a series of several conservative challengers to Romney. Um, and the fact that Romney had to not so much move rightward in terms of public policy, but shift his focus in terms of the policy matters he talked about really hurt him. And what I mean by that is, uh, is very specifically the fact that Romney, given his background in business and in the private sector, and given the still unsteady nature of the nation's uh, recovery, very much wanted this to be an election about the economy. And given the policy priorities of his uh, primary opponents, he ended up spending a lot of time over the last several months talking about abortion, talking about contraception, talking about a series of not economic, but social and cultural issues. And if you've noticed, since the day last week where Rick Santorum announced that he was not continuing his campaign, Romney has barely uttered a word about social and cultural issues and has begun to shift his focus to the uh, to the general election and economic discussion. To your specific point, Kiki, Santorum will endorse him. What I'll tell you from having worked for defeated primary candidates plenty of times in the past, it takes a while to sort of come to terms with the fact that you lost a week to, took McCain a couple months before he was ready to endorse back in, back in 2000. So Santorum will get there. But at least early public opinion polling right now shows that roughly 80% of self-described conservative Republicans say that they are satisfied with Romney as the party nominee. It's not enough to win, but it at least allows him the luxury of beginning to focus his attention on the center and on the economy rather than continuing to, to debate from the right. That's a very interesting point, Dan. And you talked about um, public policy and how sometimes, like in elections, we can uh, not talk about very important issues. I want to ask the other thing. Um, what do you think that American people will need to hear in terms of public policy um, and also what the campaign should talk about? Uh, that's a, it's a, an important issue. Uh, let me begin by reflecting back on what we already talked about here, which is I did a little quick count and we had seven policy focused presentations uh, this year. Uh, I personally found them all quite engaging, quite informative. I hope the audience did also, uh, involving students and, and presenters. And they range from things that I think will reemerge, they're already emerging, like healthcare. Um, to, uh, to those that I think are going to be lesser relevant in the campaign, but extremely important, and I wish they were going to be discussed. A, a, a really important one is U.S.'s nuclear policy, uh, which uh, Detfeld Depp, uh, Winterfeld presented and, and made a very compelling case that uh, no one wants to talk about that. <laughs> Uh, and yet it's really critical not only in terms of nuclear policy itself, but the future of energy alternatives facing the United States. Huge issues that affect all of us here in California right now, by the way, uh, but also nationwide that are going to not be discussed because uh, the candidates see no benefit. That is no partisan benefit that they're going to uh, they're going to receive from that. To things that Dal Myers brought to us in terms of closing the demographic divide in society, which of course doesn't play into politics either. <laughs> Exacerbating that divide plays into politics, but not closing it. Um, to the to the last one that we just had last week, which struck me as probably the most important single issue that will not be discussed, as it was in this room. It'll be discussed, but not in this room, which is our long-term relationship with China and the uh the uh, paths we choose to move down as a society, and they do also, in terms of collaboration and cooperation versus finding points of divergence, which do play to media and can play in some respects to partisan divide. But I doubt we'll have the, I thought, very thoughtful conversation brought to us by students and by Professor Hickela about the variety of areas where, in fact, there's a lot we need to work with together for the, the benefit of both societies that probably won't be heard about. So I'm, I'm actually uh, uh, concerned that the kinds of issues, and we heard about housing, and we heard about the national deficit, uh, uh, we heard about transportation policy, we heard about healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. A lot of these issues that were discussed in this arena may be touched on, but I don't think with the level of thought and analysis that simply one hour in this room gave us. So I'm, um, I'm not sure. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Sure. Um, I know um, a lot of California voters don't blame President Obama for gas prices, but 
they blame them for the handling of gas prices. So I know energy will be a public policy uh, topic discussed. How should maybe um, Governor Romney or um, President Obama talk about energy, especially at the state level? Like, which alternative? You say state, you mean California state, or you mean society? Uh, so like, well, in the state of California, for those of you who are here to hear uh, Pom Pom Gangulia, who spoke to us, he's from the South Coast Air Quality Management District, just rolling out for us the challenges we face in this district to meet the federal and state Clean Air Acts between now and 2025 will require moving very rapidly to zero emitting vehicles, basically electrification of our transport system in goods movements in particular, in public transport in particular, but also in individual automobiles. Uh, it seems to me that, that an effective argument would be that that is a national security issue, that's an energy supply issue, that's a clean air issue, and that's a climate change issue, all rolled into one. The upfront costs of that, however, are going to require enormous public investment. And that public investment becomes the challenge, who pays? Uh, and it comes back to who pays, and it comes back to who pays. Uh, because I did do, a, I did do a, 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 a request during that meeting on the show of hands of how many people, after they heard that, are ready to get out of their internal combustion engine and move into a pay. Probably today there's a eight or 10,000 margin cost to buying the comparable electric vehicle, even with the discounts. And I think one or two, one or two. So it's who pays and when. Um, Jeff, earlier when we were talking, you said you expressed a um, sort of sense of foreboding at the election to come based on Annenberg's own talkbacks. You had speakers come in from different media outlets and all of them showed an intense, hyper-polarized, uh, either leaning towards liberal media or conservative media. And they're not being exposed to other ideas. And by bringing them in, actually the students expose them to ideas. I just wanted to get your take on how you think that's going to affect this election to come, if it's going to make it sort of dirtier election, or? Well, thank you, Kiki. First of all, I think we had terrific reporters who came in here. But I think what, what and, and a lot of them, I think were incredibly informative in this room, and I hope that the students who had a chance to, to see them uh, appreciated what, and, and took advantage of it. But we do live in a world in which there is this polarization that, you're, that you've referred to, and, and there's something else that happens at the same time, and I'd like to maybe build on what Dan was talking about. Why isn't there that kind of serious discussion of these issues? Is part of the reason because it isn't covered in the media? It's a little hard to know which is the chicken and which yeah. is the egg. But to some extent, I think that candidates, both in President Obama and in Governor Romney, we have very serious, very smart, very well-educated uh, men who probably are substantively extremely interested in these, uh, in these issues. And in fact, if you were to sit here with them and say, what do you care about? They would, I think, say they care about these issues in a lot of depth. The problem is that we get distracted by, or the public wants to know about, or the press wants to, to uh, run stories about Hillary Rosen or Ted Nugent. These are the things that become the headlines. And so they're, it isn't that they're distracted by it, but that's what kind of dominates the headline. There's a second thing that happens, though, that goes to your point of the question about polarization. I wonder how many of you have noticed how often in a political campaign somebody says, this is the most ca important campaign in American history. <laughs> <laughs> or the other candidate is all for some, if he's elected, it's gonna be a disaster. Or if he's reelected, it's gonna be a disaster. The nation's gonna fall off a cliff. He didn't, if you didn't think he was bad this, this time, it's because he really hasn't done what he actually plans to do the next time. But why do candidates talk like that? That is part of what creates the polarization that we have. It's not new in American politics at all. But part of the reason is because you have to mobilize people to go out to vote. Otherwise, why should they go to vote at all? And to some extent, I think what happens in campaigns is the lack of seriousness, which Dan is talking about in terms of a lot of the discussion of the issues, 
is, and, and part of the reason the press doesn't cover it in more deep, deep depth is the candidates really aren't being entirely honest with us. They agree on so much more than they will say in a campaign. And there's a front page story, in the, I think, in the LA Times today about Afghanistan. And it talks about how difficult it is for Romney to actually have a differentiable position. That's also true of Iran. Yeah. He doesn't actually have a position that's different from Obama's. Or I could say Obama's doesn't really have one <laughs> that's different from him. But they have to make it sound like it's going to be a disaster if the other guy's elected. So in a certain way, there's something about politics and something about the media coverage of politics, and maybe that's being exacerbated even by new sources of news and the polarization we have, in which we, we don't have as honest a dialogue as, as I think we ought to about these issues. And, and you know, I hope that the students who have, are exposed to these reporters and to these substantive issues and to these politi political figures and, to, and to other students will have the sophistication to know that in the end we have to all govern together and not treat each other or our issues as caricatures. Uh, Dan, going off of that, um, Jeff, Hillary Rosen, and there have been other things like Rush Limbaugh's comments on the Sander Fluke thing. Um, and it's interesting to look at how each campaign has actually responded to it, whether it's Axelrod tweeting very quickly that he does not see Romney as a non-work, I mean, and Romney as a non-working woman. Um, in a way, have has Twitter or Facebook um, made campaigns and candidates more responsible to voters? And is that sort of bringing voters into the know of each campaign, sort of decreasing the space between the two? Well, it's, it's, it's a great question. I hope Jeff will uh, take a shot at it also, given, given, given his communications and media expertise. Real, real quick, uh, once again, going back to your previous question, Kiki, I'll say this. One of the things that struck me from the lunches where, Annen, where C, uh, Center for Communications Leadership in Annenberg took the lead is it was interesting to watch journalists you know, freed of the uh, neutrality that they need to show in their coverage, exhibiting their opinions. But to me, I think a real benefit that came from that was for a more conservative student to have a chance to hear someone like Bob Shear, for a more liberal student to have a chance to hear somebody like the late Andrew Breitbart, is the kind of cross-conversation that doesn't take place nearly enough in, uh, in American politics. So I think your, your previous question about polarization is exactly right, but I like what these guys did to try to push back against it. Yeah, does social media and does online media change the nature of a, of a political campaign? Um, it certainly does, and in all sorts of ways. And I have enough respect for my co-panelists not to take the last 40 minutes talking about all the various ways that online media has changed campaigns. But to me, one of the one of the most the, the two most important ways that the political conversation has changed over the last couple of election cycles, given these tools of communication technology, is one, it's made the, commu it's made the conversation progress much faster. Now, if Rush Limbaugh or Hillary Rosen or Ted Nugent or someone not affiliated with the campaign says something that I think Dan would correctly have categorized as extraneous. <laughs> It's the sort of thing that a campaign that the campaigns would get caught up in for days and days and days at a time. Campaign responds before five o'clock on day one, it shows up in the next day's morning newspaper. The opposing campaign responds in day two, it shows up in the paper the day after that. That sort of drags out. To me, one of the advantages of online media is it moves that stuff through the system pretty quickly. <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily mean we move from talking about Ted Nugent to talking about US-Chinese relations, <laughs> but it means that a conversation that really isn't all that impactful for the voters catches our attention quickly but doesn't really consume us on an ongoing basis. But to me, real quickly, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass the, the microphone. To me, the biggest change that's taken place in the last two election cycles as a result of online media. And those of you who are in poli sci 439 have heard me talk about this, is it's changed the political conversation from a unidirectional, a one-way conversation from the candidates and the campaigns at the voters to a multi-directional conversation in which the voters do have the ability, to your question, the voters do have the ability to talk back to the campaigns and the candidates, and even more importantly, to communicate with each other in a much more efficient and a, a much more effective way. And I think the real seminal change in online communication that took place in 2008 with uh, Obama's uh, first campaign for president was not so much in terms of advances in technology, 
but a difference in philosophy. Because one of the things that we learned working on campaigns as I was working in that field was the importance of message discipline. You develop a message and you stay on that message and you repeat that message no matter what over and over and over again. And if you got a surrogate or a supporter you know, or a staff member, they're given their talking points and they're not allowed to say anything else. And what the Obama campaign realized that uh, campaigns of neither party had realized up until 2008 is such as the nature of an online audience is that if you tell them exactly what to say, they're probably not going to play with you. But if you give them a chance to weigh in, if you give them a chance to have their voice heard, if you empower that online audience, they're much more likely to participate and they're much more likely to be active and excited and engaged. I think what David Axelrod and David Pluff and Joe Rospars decided four years ago, which both parties seem to have learned now, is it's worth giving up a little bit of message discipline. It's worth risking that one of your supporters might say something like a Hillary Rosen or a Ted Nugent does. That's a risk worth taking. If it makes tens of thousands of volunteers supporting your candidate feel empowered to participate in the creation of the message, not just in repeating it over and over. Could I just chime in on that? I've got my two messaged colleagues here who can speak to it further, but I'm curious how anybody would think about this uh, process change in communications, timing, dispersion, uh, decentralization of control in the sense of the message. But it strikes me that the, the messages discussed in the policy arena, at least those we've heard and others like them, that as you characterize, I would think important, and I do, and I think they're really the critical ones facing our society or we wouldn't have brought them forward, aren't the topics of conversation. So that what we've done is change the mode of communications, but not the topics of communications. So when we talk about voting about issues of really critical importance, they're still on the uh, uh, ideology or, or, or value points that are not trivial, but they really aren't those issues that are gonna affect long-term nature of our society. Well, I think, I think in a way, what you're talking about, Dan, is an idyllic view of the way you'd like campaigns to work. Absolutely. I'm not sure they ever really, <laughs> yeah, but I'm not sure they ever really did. I'm not sure they did either. But the idyllic thing, as I understand what you're talking about, wouldn't it be great if we could have a serious conversation uh, and learn from and yeah. grow together? Uh, but that is not what happens in political campaigns. And, and the three of us on this panel have been around enough campaigns to know at least in our lifetimes, you know, wh how small the things were that even turned the outcomes of the campaign. You know, people can tell you now Obama's going to win or, or, or Romney, or, they don't know what they're, they don't know the history because things happen during the campaign that nobody can predict. Uh, Gerald Ford would say something foolish in a, in a debate that he knows much better than to say, but it was sort of a foolish comment about whether Poland was a free country or not. Was it Poland? I think so. Just yeah. a silly thing. It wasn't what he thought, but it becomes a defining thing in a campaign. You can't predict it. In the, in the Nixon-Kennedy uh, campaign, there was a fight about two islands, Kamoi and Matsu. They became proxies for much, much bigger issues, but they weren't really serious issues. So in a way, I don't think think campaigns have ever been about doing this idyllic thing you're talking about, which is developing positions that are important to understand. I don't think it's idyllic. I think it's important. But the, uh, if I, may, I was just commenting, though, on, on Dan's comment about the process changing. And I was just b observing that the process seems to be changing quite radically, but not the substance mm -hmm. of it. That's and that correct. was just a commentary yeah. on that. Yeah, that and, it, right. and, it, and unfortunate, because I think at the, if you go back 10 or 15 years on the digital democracy discussion among scholars and practitioners, this was going to be the method that we finally were going to be able to get substance into our campaigns and into our dialogues as a society, and I just don't see a lot of it. We're going to give control of the panel back to you guys in just one second, <laughs> but if I, if I can just make one more sure. point to hopefully wrap this up. A couple of thoughts. Um, Number one, I think running for president in, in Masmania instead of in the United States of America <laughs> would be a much more edifying experience. <laughs> one of the, one of the frust challenges that I faced when I worked on campaigns, um, one of the frustrations uh, as well, was the distance between the world I wanted to live in and the world that I lived in. I wish I lived in a world in which more voters watched the news hour than watched entertainment tonight. I wish I lived in a world in which more voters would share your concern about U.S.-China relationships as opposed to uh, what you know, Ted Nugent said about Barack Obama yesterday. Now, I don't live in that world. And so you have two options at that point. One is to howl at the moon and hope the world changes. 
the second is to take the world for what it is. And this is to really, to me, the third and uh, also extremely important point of what online media has allowed to happen in campaigns. It means that somebody who wants to have a serious conversation about energy policy, or about US-China policy, or about housing policy can in a way that wasn't available 15 years ago. Because even though you're outnumbered, there are millions of you around the country who can communicate in a much more efficient way than you could have, uh, th th than you could have a generation ago. Um, and if there are people who want to spend time focusing on what you and I might consider to be less serious, they can too. So on one hand, there's a real freedom, there's a real empowerment that comes with online media. You can focus on so-called serious stuff, you can focus on so-called unserious stuff, and different people can define what serious is. Um, the, the flip side of that is I think you end up with uh, uh, a real bifurcated uh, electorate. Some of you may remember the phrase from some years ago, the digital divide. And it suggested that online media would not be available to those who lacked sufficient economic resources. And what's happened over the years, just as it happened with the telephone and with radio and with television and with cable TV, is prices come down. And those things become more and more accessible. So to me, the real digital divide today is not an economic one or a social or cultural one. It's a self-imposed one between people who want to be part of Dan Masmanian's conversation about the future of US-China relationships and my conversation, in which you find out what's on Barack Obama and Mitt Romney's iPod. And, and, but let me ask this, uh, and I apologize for, for but um, don't we wind up with what we might consider to be smaller issues becoming proxies for more important ones, so that something will happen during the campaign. I don't know what yet. Well, none of us can predict it, but there'll be a moment when China will be an important topic. It may come through some small thing, which seems like somebody's comment or slip of the tongue or something, but it's enough to get people then talking about that issue. Doesn't, it, doesn't that happen? I think not only does it happen, it, it, it's happening right now and it already has. We, we made fun of Hillary Rosen, and I think most of you are familiar with her comments about Ann Romney's uh, work history uh, outside the house or, or lack thereof. Now, by any measure, that's a silly argument to have. There's five trillion reasons to vote for Mitt Romney or Barack Obama for president. Whether Ann Romney held a paying job outside the house is no, not one of them. So on one level, it's a silly conversation. On the other hand, it does lead into a much broader and much more serious conversation about gender and pay equity, about uh, the ability and willingness of women to work outside the home, and it speaks directly to the group of prob probably the most in uh, important group of swing voters in this election, married female voters, many of whom are struggling between these two choices. So it's a silly sideshow in the immediate but it tells you a lot about right. Barack Obama right. and Mitt Romney coming all the way back to Kiki's first point. The ferocity with which the Obama campaign responded against a Democratic surrogate shows that they understand the importance of uh, the married women vote and a sideshow turns into something uh, with, with, with more significant policy mm -hmm. ramifications. All right. You're, it belongs to you guys again. Yeah, so I think we have time for one more question from us before we open it up to you guys to ask questions. And um, because this is the last talk back, uh, and we don't have the luxury when we go home to have a, an esteemed panel of people who are experts on this field. Um, can you guys all, this is open for all three of you, can you tell us a little bit about the transition from the primary campaign to the general that we're going to be seeing in these next three months over the summer? Um, and what can we anticipate to happen or change in the next few months in regards to each of your fields? I'll just say I like being called lovely more than I like being called esteemed, so if we can go back to that. <laughs> Is that, is that, that, that's it? No, 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 that's all I have to say. <laughs> well, I think actually Dan began uh, by suggesting that Romney's evolving strategy and the diminution of social issues with a focus on the economy, uh, it seems that that from the Republican point of view is where they're going to focus their attack. The, the uh, Middle East, uh, Iran, Iraq, it's very difficult to differentiate effectively, it seems to me, on that issue. Some of the other issues that we've talked about, uh, the housing one, which we began this in terms of a substantive issue, is a, is a, a, a casting a shadow over the American economy and the American people's thinking about government, um, is going to possibly come back over about who's doing more to help. Uh, but it's going to be, once again, in the backdrop of the role of government 
as well as the role of the private sector, the banks, and individual responsibility. So those domestic issues are probably going to dominate I would say for two reasons. One is it's hard to find a position that Barack Obama is taking on the international arena that most Americans are going to disagree with. Uh, and I haven't heard any policy positions that are dramatically different than his coming from the Republican side. And Romney feels, I think, that he really can win on this debate about the role of government and the role of individuals and the role of states within the context of those domestic issues. I think, if, first of all, foreign policy does become an issue in the campaign. It'll be a, a, because of something we don't yet anticipate. Yeah. And, and I think it's sure to happen that some, something will happen that we can't predict. So you can bank on it. We can predict that we can't You can predict, predict the, the unpredictable. Uh, Obama has been running a general election campaign throughout. Yeah. And in a certain way, that's been a luxury for him. And as Dan said, uh, Romney's been running a, had to run a primary campaign knowing that he wanted as much room as he could to move back to a general election campaign. Um, so I think it is a change for, for Romney, but it's obviously one he's totally anticipated. The, the thing that's going to ch be different in this campaign than previous campaigns, I think one huge difference, is going to be the role of these super PACs. And um, I frankly think Citizens United was wrong as a matter of law, leaving aside that I think it's terrible policy, but I also disagree with it as a law, and as you know, I'm a lawyer too. But on the other hand, it is the law of the land. And so um, we saw what happened in the primaries the way in which these super PACs wound up defining, to a large extent, the primary. Whatever messages we're talking about, the campaigns we're putting out, their supporters, with a slight degree of plausible deniability, or actual deniability from the candidates, were pouring huge amount of money into, camp into uh, particularly television ads, some of them long-form television ads, that had their own, their own narrative. Um, I think that's certain to happen in the election, in the general election campaign. And so we're going to have an awful lot of money being spent. And most people get most of their news during a campaign. Dan can perhaps give me, refine this a bit. But most people still get most of their news from broadcasting. And most of the information that they get about political campaigns they get from paid political ads. We've done a lot of studies over the years at the Annenberg School, particularly Marty Kaplan and his group, of the amount of time that is actually spent on covering campaigns on the uh, new local and national newscasts. It's, it's surprisingly small, tiny. But you're going to be barraged, especially, you'll see less of this in California, because California is thought to be a foregone conclusion, pretty much. But there are about 12 states and you're not going to see what's happening in the 12 states unless you watch some nightly news show that shows you the ads from those states. But there'll be about 12 states in which a incredible money, hundreds and hundreds of million dollars are being spent, not just by the candidates, but by people who are trying to find the election. And that will be a huge change as the people who were uh, as Romney stops using his his money to or his uh, super PAC supporting him to to support it to to attack his candidates, all of a sudden they're attacking Obama, and as uh, Obama's money emerges, he'll have less of it. But there will be some, I'm certain, in super PACs to attack Romney, and that may not be the campaign any of us would like to see either. But that's the campaign we're going to see. And this political cycle, and also, will this really uh, make us more polarized as a nation? Well, it's, it, it's a great question. I think Jeff did a very good job of, of, of laying out the landscape of a, of a political environment in which unlimited amounts of money can be spent by individuals or corporations or labor unions on behalf of the candidate or cause of their choosing. And I'm not wild about that either. I think the idea that someone, by virtue of their checkbook, should get 100,000 votes or 500,000 votes or a million votes when you only get one, uh, un unfairly skews the uh, uh, playing field in all sorts of unfortunate ways. So I think Jeff and I agree that this, these are, th this is not a good development. And 
but I think where we would disagree is its impact on the general election. In the primary, the super PACs had a huge impact because they single-handedly propped up otherwise underfunded candidates. Candidates like Gingrich and Santorum were be able to remain competitive with Romney because they had a couple friendly billionaires willing to continue to pump money into their campaigns. This fall, both Romney and Obama are probably going to raise, either directly or through surrogates or allies, close to or just over $1 billion. So it's difficult to see. There was a B. One billion. One though. billion, yes. Yeah. So it won't be a trillion until 2016. <laughs> um, so I don't know that there's a, a, a fundamental partisan advantage uh, in either direction. Um, but I want to go back to another point that Jeff made earlier, too, and then we probably ought to try to get in a couple of these guys' questions. Jeff talked about the advantage that Barack Obama had by not having a primary campaign. And some of you have heard me discuss this before, so I'll go through, through it pretty quickly. But I would say that even though today the, the, the new New York Times CBS poll this morning shows the race a dead heat, 47% to 47%, I think you would still consider, need to consider Obama as a favorite in this election for the reason that Jeff mentioned. Because while Romney was fighting to fend off a series of conservative challenges and talking about issues in a way other than he would have chosen, Obama, the President Obama did not have a primary campaign. And you can go back through 50 years of American presidential political history and what you will see going all the way back to Lyndon Johnson is that every American incumbent president who faced a primary challenge was not re-elected. And conversely, every incumbent American president who did not face a significant primary challenge for the last 50 years did gain re-election. And that's not a coincidence, because when someone like Jimmy Carter, for example, faces a challenge from a more liberal Ted Kennedy, or when George Bush Sr. faces a challenge from a more conservative alternative like Pat Buchanan, they have to do what Romney did this year. They have to go fight in the end zones. But when you're an incumbent like Obama and you don't have a Russ Feingold or a Howard Dean running against you, you can set up on the 50-yard line. And so candidate, Ob candidate Obama, freed of the obligation of a primary challenge, can call for a cut in the corporate tax. He can talk about increased oil drilling that his administration has taken on in a way that he would not be able to facing a, uh, a more liberal challenge. And I think that gives him a seminal, not a seminal, but a significant advantage going into the general election. And then, and then the, the last point I'd make quickly is to uh, circle back over something I mentioned earlier about the critical importance of a particular demographic group. Jeff correctly talked about certain states that are going to determine this election. Of all the demographic groups that will decide this election, it will be married female voters. How many people in this room have mothers? Well, be nice to them. Convince them to vote in your direction because ultimately they're going to decide this election. You've read a lot about the gender gap. But on recent polls, Obama enjoys a, a lead of between 17, 18, 19 points among female voters and Romney is winning by a small margin among male voters. The gap between married voters and single voters is even greater. And so what that means, if married voters vote Republican, if female voters tend to vote Democrat, married female voters are going to decide this election, that's why the two campaigns engaged in such a pitched debate as they did over Hillary Rosen's comments, because they know even several months from an election, this particular very specific demographic voting group is going to, is going to decide the election. Okay, at this time I'm going to open it up to you guys for any questions. So, hi. Hi. Um, so, I was wondering if you could hi. Given the gap in the gender divide, we kind of said that Mommy's done talking about social issues if he has the chance to stay away from them. But I do think that he might have to address some of the social issues that maybe um, left and kind of hovering around him as a result of the primary. Um, do you have any advice for him on addressing those issues? Um, can he just defer them all to his wife? What should he do? Well, I, I don't advise candidates anymore. Um, <laughs> But I, but, but I would say that uh, you've raised an important point, Kaya, which is because the economic recovery will still look shaky, it is a very smart strategy for Obama's political team to try to force the conversation to some of the social issues, in particular immigration issues, because Romney had to move so far rightward in the primary. It's the kind of thing that's going to cost him huge, huge amounts of support among Latino and Latina voters. It's a fact he himself alluded to in a speech to uh, uh, campaign donors earlier this week. He said, if we don't do something to reach out to Latinos, we can't win this election. Um, no question that the debate they had over contraception earlier this spring is something that Romney would just as soon leave behind and Obama's advisors would just as soon put front and center. 
I'm not sure a candidate can get away with it quite this inartfully, but watch for Romney to say something like, thank you for that fascinating co uh, question about contraception. Let me talk to you about the economy and job creation. <laughs> and my guess is by the fall he will do it in a slightly more sophisticated way than that. But I, I'm guessing that the people around him are saying, look, you did what you had to do in the primary. Now in the general election, if you're going to win, it's going to be by talking about the economy. The last time you spent talking about other things, the, the, the better off you are. Um, David Azevedo, MPA, uh, High School. Um, my question is for everyone, in regards to personalities, person, personality really has a major impact in the election. We saw that with Barack Obama's kind of legendary, legendary hope kind of candidacy, and then the maverick candidacy of John McCain, and the have a beer with the president candidacy of George Bush versus the flip flop or Kerry, and so on. And it seems that these candidates right now, I mean, Barack can't run on the hope personality. He's got to find something else. Barack is kind of this kind of a, you know, just in a very ambiguous, nebulous kind of personality right now. What do you think their personalities are going to be like come in November, and which one do you think has a harder time at being a convincing personality for let, let me start the, yeah. that for a second. It's a wonderful question, and, and it is true that I read a column the other day about how, in the end, this person is going to be our living room for the next four years, and that has an effect. Now, people did not vote for Richard Nixon because they wanted him in their living room, and probably not for Lyndon Johnson because they wanted him in the living room. So it isn't always the living room war in that sense. But still, it, it has an effect. It really does, and it probably has an effect on all of us. I know it has an effect on me. Um, but um, the thing I don't understand, I think, I think Obama is a very good campaigner who is well-liked and will be attractive in the campaign as a person, as he's been. Uh, interestingly, he seems to be more attractive on the campaign trail than, than when he's not in a campaign mode. I don't understand why that is, but he, for example, has not, unlike Bill Clinton, who you know, brought everybody into the White House and, and you know, whatever their political ideology and listened to them and loved being with them, that has not been Obama's style at all. But, but, um, so, but I think on the campaign trail, he's going to be a very attractive candidate. I would have thought Romney would have been. I would have thought so. And frankly, I know people who like Romney very much, who have worked with him over the years. But somehow, as a candidate, he doesn't seem natural. And he keeps making these miss, these very awkward statements. It's tight Levi's. And I can't help wondering whether, when that happens, you become a little scared of the ad lib. You become scared of the human quality you've got. And, and whether that will hurt him in the campaign. I think it's unknown because he hasn't been in this role yet. But so far, the natural living room Romney has not really emerged as an engaging character. No, I, I, I agree. It's, it's a McLuhan-esque kind of phenomenon, possibly. I'll, I'll offer this real quick so we can get on to other questions. But I, one, I think it's a phenomenal question. Um, that said, I would argue that personality, and for that matter, biography, is not really a decider for most voters. It's more of a threshold that you need to get past. Once you decide you're comfortable with someone, once you decide that you like or trust or respect them, then you're free to consider them on public policy matters. I would bet if I asked the people, everyone in this room who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 to raise their hand, which I am, which I am not doing, if I did, and then we questioned you, I can't imagine, I would be surprised if any of you said, I voted for him because I liked him more than McCain or I liked him because he gave an inspiring speech. My guess is you voted for him because you believed what he had to say about the war in Iraq or about health care or job creation was preferable to what you heard from the Republican nominee. Um, so the, the, the ease, the familiarity, the other communication skills that Jeff talked about that Obama showed on the campaign, I think instru were instrumental in getting people to pay attention to him. But ultimately, as archaic as it sounds, I really do believe it's policy that closes the deal. And that means the question for Romney is can he get past that threshold? And real quickly, I think, I think once again, Jeff has framed it the right way. Once you make a mistake of any kind, you get gun shy. You tend to second guess yourself. Um, the other candidate over the years who reminds me of Romney in this regard was Al Gore when he ran for president. And I have friends who worked for Gore, my younger brother an otherwise bright young man, worked for Al Gore for several years in the 1990s. And what they would tell me is they'd say, Al Gore is the funniest, craziest, zaniest, most fun guy you'll ever meet. 
I'm thinking, Al Gore? <laughs> and then a couple years after the election, a book came out, terrific book, by the way, I'd recommend it, called Politics Lost. Politics Lost by Joe Klein. And the subhead is how, why, how American political consultants ruined American politics. Mm -hmm. And Klein is having dinner with some of Gore's advisors from the campaign a couple years later when Gore is off on his climate change uh, uh, trajectory. And Klein says he's so excited, he's so energized when he talks about these things. Why didn't he talk about these things in the campaign? And Gore's advisors said with some pride, oh, we didn't let him. It, we told him that if he talked about climate change and global warming, it could cost him Ohio, it could cost him Pennsylvania, it could cost him West Virginia, it could cost him Indiana, it could cost him Michigan. So I thought, no wonder Al Gore seemed like such a stiff. Here's something that's so, so integral, not only important to him, but integral to who he is. And he wasn't allowed to talk about it. And I don't know if for Mitt Romney if that's his faith. I don't know if it's other things. But there's something that he doesn't think he should talk about or his advisors are telling him he's not allowed to talk about. And the result is the kind of candidate who uh, Jeff and Dan were, were talking about. <laughs> I feel pretty passionately about this issue, and it's hard to be in a nonpartisan mode in talking about it, honestly. I mean, a part of my life I spent registering voters in the South during a period when, uh, before the Civil Rights Act. Um, most of us in the panel grew up during that era, knew people during that era, era who were involved. And I've been writing a book about the 1912 political campaign. And in 1912, we went from the period of Reconstruction, which had its own serious problems, to the Jim Crow laws, which effectively disenfranchised black voters throughout the South. An incredible, incredible period. It's hard to read about it without just saying, how could that happen? There were a million black voters registered, something like this, in Louisiana in, um, I may have the, that wrong, but a huge number, something like a million, registered in Louisiana in 1890, and by 1905, there were like a couple hundred. When I hear about what's happening to make it hard for people to vote because of a concern about, alleged concern about fraud, I can't ha help feeling echoes of that. And I'm not saying it would ever go that far again, but to me, it is a shameful way to try to win elections, and I, and I think it's a very sad thing that's happening um, in, in a few states, including right now, I think, in Florida. In Florida, they've made it, it's not just that they're making it hard for people to vote, but also they're making it hard for people to come in and register voters. They've made it so that the kinds of groups like the League of Women Voters or others whose jobs would have been to go out and register people to vote, they've made it so that they are so easily charged with criminal conduct that those people are afraid to go in and even register people to vote. So in Florida, there's no voter registration campaign going on. Can I, can I just comment on that too? I think it's really quite important, and it's not just on the individual level, it's how we design institutions, both uh, political institutions uh, uh, that enable minority voice, no matter what that minority is. Uh, but but uh, the comparison to other societies, I, I always uh, hesitate to accuse people of, of a racial or ideological or class or partisan bias when they're trying to legitimize the electoral process. So I want to reserve judgment, but, but part of my judgment is based on a comparative analysis. If at the same time, California or any other state or any other jurisdiction said, we have a concern with fraud, with double voting counting, with illegal people voting and so forth, the challenge then is an affirmative one on the state, on the government, to ensure that all those eligible do vote, and they do that in other societies. That is, it becomes the, actually the responsibility of postal service workers to register people in other societies as they go from door to door delivering the mail. Uh, if you want a, a photograph ID, then have an affirmative strategy to get everybody photographed and authenticated. 
which is very different than saying if you don't have one and have not secured it in your own way, in your own means, you can't vote. So my judgment about intent really goes to, it's one thing to say we want a legitimate, fair, open system and we want a, a, a legitimate voting and so forth for all those qualified, but then the state has a responsibility or the authority involved has a responsibility to ensure that's distributed equitably. And so uh, I am suspicious of some of the things I see going on because that doesn't meet my test of is it, is it being made available then as an affirmative responsibility of the state, of government. This is what somebody like me who occupies the space relatively close to the political center finds most aggravating about politics. Not just your question, which is a terrific one, but it's symbolic of a much broader problem in American politics that drives people away from the polls in droves. On one end, you have people who say, it's all about ballot security, I don't care about ballot access at all, it's all about ballot security. On the other hand, you have people who say, it's all about ballot access, I don't care about ballot security at all. And the, and the idea that you could actually find a solution somewhere in between the 20-yard lines, rather than the ideological end zones, is anathema to both sides. So there's an old, old saying, one of my favorites, to say, if you can't solve a problem, make it bigger. If you can't solve a problem, make it bigger. So think about, why do we vote the way we do? Why do we vote for a 12-hour period on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November? Because our founding fathers wanted to set the election at a time when farmers had a chance to bring their fields and their crops in from the field and get to the nearest municipality to cast a vote in late fall. That's why we have an electoral college that allows for two months of you know, non, non, uh, time to elapse time to elapse in between the election and the inauguration of the president. So let's say for the sake of argument that we do not live in an agrarian, an agrarian society anymore. Let's say for the sake of argument that we live in a society in which there are forms of transportation and communication that were not available to John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. So just take that flight of fancy with me. <laughs> and so then maybe what you can do is instead of saying the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November is when you vote, say look, we're gonna have, vo we're gonna have voting on the weekends. We're going to voting from 8 a.m. on Friday till 8 p.m. on Sunday. And you can vote at any time during that period. And by the way, if you don't have an ID, come on Friday or Saturday, and that gives us a chance to process you and make sure that the, 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 you know, make, make sure that the proper del del deliberations are taken. But you get a chance to vote. Similarly, and it confounds me that the state of California, the home of Silicon Valley, has been uh, oozing toward this for over a decade now with no apparent sign of progress. While I'm not entirely comfortable with online voting, just because I don't understand how to use the internet as well as these guys do, and I'm a little bit nervous that they're going to pick my president for me. I know Aaron feels very strongly about the Justin Bieber for president campaign, by the way. Um, I know one direction, right, Kiki? Okay. Um, but I do think online registration ought to be available for everyone. And therefore, if there is a security concern, you have plenty of time to check it between the time the person registers and the time they go to vote on election day or election weekend or election week. But to me, the fact that we're having this uh, mutually exclusive zero-sum game argument saying it's access, it's security, it's security, it's access, is, re reflects, the, I think, too many voters' broader frustrations about why American politicians don't make more of an effort to, to come to midfield. Yeah. One quick one question, Pat. This is mostly the Dan thing can respond. Uh, so on Monday, there's a letter that came out from the Santorum campaign in Iowa, I believe, um, that was headlined, it truly frightens me to think what will happen if Mitt Romney is the nominee. Um, did you write that letter for them, Kyle? <laughs> well, honestly, I wish I did. But uh, given some of the, like, the very vitriolic things that were said over the course of this very brutal campaign, especially in like swing primaries in swing states, Ohio, Florida, et cetera. Um, do you think the Republican Party is going to try and kind of, because I mean, the, the, the combination of super PACs that can basically only legally do negative advertising and this very drawn out primary process where these candidates were allowed to hang on long after they had any viral PAC production seems to have kind of led to a lot of very negative net messaging and it seems to have been a harmful or wrong. Do you think the Republican Party is going to try and do something to revisit this primary process or try and make it a little bit more constructive for the party? 
Uh, I thought your question was going to go in a different direction. Uh, I thought you were going to ask if Santorum and Romney were going to be able to make up after all the horrible things that Santorum said about Romney. And I would have said, I think that Santorum and Romney are just as likely to make up as Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama did after Hillary Clinton ran ads suggesting that Barack Obama was not prepared to be president. But I think the question you did ask is a, is a fascinating one. Republicans generally have been... Uh, uh, have picked their, uh, have awarded their delegates to candidates in a winner-take-all basis. Um, and Democrats have given their delegates to candidates on a proportional basis. And this, to me, more than anything, reflects not the ideological, but sort of the philosophical differences between the two parties. Republicans are very Darwinian. You won, you lose, you get all the delegates, you go home. Okay, what's next? Democrats are more nurturing. <laughs> you didn't lose. You finish second. <laughs> Have some delegates and some ice cream. <laughs> I think they're more receptive to diversity. Well, I'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> but for, in, in, in different years, the two approaches work better for one party or the other. Four years ago, Republicans watched the Democrats uh, uh, arguing it out between Clinton and Obama and saw all this attention and all this enthusiasm and all that excitement and said, wow, if we change the rules to award our, our delegates more gradually, we can get some of that too. Didn't quite work out that way. I suspect Republicans go back to Darwinian probably by, hmm. by 2012. Probably true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that wraps it up. I'd like you guys to please give a round of applause to our... Well, thank all of you and I think we look forward to uh, the fall season.